Welcome, welcome. My name is Pastor Chris, and uh, my wife here, Casey, on the front row with our our little baby um, Wyatt. I had to think about it. I was like Benjamin. No, it's, it's Wyatt. You know, you forget who's who. You know. Um, so anyway, I just want to let you guys know that for those of you that are new and that are visiting, you know, th- this is who we are. This is who we really aspire to be for you. We want to be a church to call home and a family to call your own. That, that's kind of the language that we use around here. Um, you know, we're not some big, you know, conglomerate or corporation. Like, we want to be your family. And, and we want to be a place that you could say, you know what, this is a place that I could call, I could call home. And you'll hear us say it all the time, we're a friendly church. And we just want to inspire you to have an encounter with Jesus. Whether you're saved, unsaved, Christian, not Christian, Anglican, it doesn't matter. If, if you could have a moment here today where you're just inspired to, to think about Jesus, that's, that's really what we want to do. Um, and then you guys all have something on your seat. We call this a value card, and, and on one side, this is how, the, how you can give to us. You can give your tithe, your offering. Uh, it's got all the information that you need here, uh, and I just want to thank you so much for doing that. When you give, it means that you're trusting God with your finances, and it means that you trust us, and, and you see something in us that we're doing that you want to support and give to, and so every gift that comes in, we really thank you so much for that. That's how the lights and stuff you know, even come on. And then on the other side of that card, you'll see... Uh, a couple different areas, especially if you're new, I just want you to see this. There's a place where you can put prayer requests in there and you can drop those at the info table outside. Um, or you can put them in a little box going out the door. Uh, and we do pray for you. We have a whole prayer team that prays. And then these other two areas on the other side, we've got a thing called Next. And Next is our way of sort of branding this, this idea of, you know, come find out more about us. We want to be authentic. We want to be transparent. And then we want to give you the opportunity to say, do I like this? Do I not like this? Uh, We don't want for you to kind of try and figure out who we are and what we are. So we just tell you up front. And so we've got one of these on Sunday, April 16th. It's after the service. It's in here. It's about 30 minutes. It's just a good uh, chat. And then community groups, that's another thing on there you can sign up for. And we've got a women's study coming up that I want to just draw your attention to. Um, It's called Women Connect, the Essentials of Effective Prayer. It's a a six-week, no-homework Bible study, um, and it starts Thursday, the 13th of April at 9.30 a.m., and you can contact Joy there. And if you don't get this number here, that's okay, because we have one magic phone number. This is our magic phone number. This is a broadcast list, okay? Now, some of you guys, now, this is where I'm talking to our members. Some of you guys are busted, okay? I got you. Because this number goes to a phone that I hold. And on Friday, we had this really cool video uh, that we played on Good Friday where it, it read some text and it scrolled down and, and it kind of was Jesus going to the cross because of our sin. And then as it scrolled up, it was the same text in a different direction. And it talked in it, and the message chain to talk about reversing sin. It was amazing. I mean, I was crying. Everybody was crying. Everyone wanted that. So what I did is I sent it out on this list to this number. And I had a bunch of people that are on this list that are on this number ask me, hey, where's that video? And I just want you to know that the Holy Spirit came over me (laughs) and said, don't don't type what you want to type. (laughs) Which is, you've not opened your message from the, you know, from us here, because then you would you would have no, so I just I send it out to them. But but what I try and do on the, with this number here is it's just a good way to, for you to get information and for us to get information out to you, like what's going on, what's happening, uh, you know, what's going on in the life of the church. So uh, I don't send a ton out. Um, yeah, it really is just the the essentials. So I, I want to pray for us and pray over the the word that we're about to get into here, um, and I'm excited about it. Heavenly Father, I just pray that that you bless what I'm about to say, that it come from you, that it come only from you, that it just, it be yours. So Lord, I, I just, I volunteer my heart, my mind, uh, my agenda, everything to you, Father. And I pray for uh, everyone in this auditorium that their ears would hear the words you want them to hear and that their heart would receive the love and what it is that you want them to receive. So Lord, set up your holy filter in between me and them and let everybody hear what comes from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we get into Easter, today is Easter. I just want to say I've already done something uh, wrong today. I had someone come up to me this morning and, and say, you know, Christ is risen and shook my hand. And I looked at them and said, yeah, he has. You know, and they said, 
Christ is risen today. Yeah, today, you know, it's Easter. I didn't know you're supposed to say Christ is risen indeed, you know, and give the other, <laughs> give the other half of that. So um, I grew up Southern Baptist. We didn't do that stuff. Um, you know, uh, so anyway, I, I'm trying to get that right. So today is a, is a special day. It's a very special day because today is the day that we celebrate Jesus walking out of the tomb and him coming out of the grave. And, and that makes uh, today one of the most special days for, for us Christians because there's a lot that comes behind that. There's a lot of meaning that comes from that. And many of you know that. I don't have to reteach a lot of the meaning for this stuff with you. But, but there's a, a statement here. It's not about who Jesus was. So, so we don't celebrate Easter because Jesus was an amazing teacher or because he was really smart or because he was a great prophet or because he could gather people behind him or because he performed miracles or because... He said all the right things at the right times. That's not what makes Jesus so amazing or, or makes Easter so amazing. It, it's actually, it's what he did. See, Jesus did the one thing that no one else could do. He resurrected, he raised himself, and he walked out of the tomb. Nobody else in, ever has, has done that or can do that. So Jesus did the one and only thing that only Jesus could do. And that's why this day is so important, and that's why it's so special, and that's why we celebrate it, because he walked out of that grave. So what this means is that everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus taught, everything that he was, it means that it was true. Because without the resurrection, Jesus was just a good teacher. He was just a good rabbi. He was just, just good at gathering people. He was attractional. He would have been trending on TikTok or Twitter, you know, in, in those days. Jesus was, was more than that, though, and he was only more than that because he resurrected, he stepped out of the grave. So if Jesus steps out of the grave, if the resurrection is real and it's true, and, and it is, and we're going to talk about all the people that saw him after he resurrected if that's real if that's true then that means that everything in the bible is real everything in the bible is true and so here especially in church i don't think anyone would raise their hand and say well i don't believe that jesus resurrected you you may privately think that and, that, and that, that's okay there's actually you know a lot of people that that don't believe that and in fact the jews did a whole bunch of work to make sure that nobody actually believed in jesus time that he himself walked out of the tomb but, but many of us do, do believe, like, okay, yeah, J Jesus walked out of the tomb. So if we believe that Jesus walked out of the tomb, then that means we believe everything that was written in the Bible, everything that Jesus said. But we don't. And, and that's okay. Now, it, if Jesus is who we say he is, the one that walked out of the tomb, then it, it should be, see, it should be so easy for us to introduce like Jesus to other people. It should be easy for us to believe in him when we're afraid or worried. It should be easy for us to have faith in him. You know, all those amazing Bible verses that say, do not be anxious. You know, it's like, okay, cool, no longer anxious. You know, the ones that say, do not worry. Okay, great, I'm not worried. You know, the ones that say, do not fear, fantastic, no longer afraid. It's in the Bible, it's written, it's done. The ones that say, uh, you know, the only way to heaven is, is through salvation, is through grace, is through accepting Jesus. Oh, okay. This dude got up, he walked out of a grave. All I have to do is accept him in my heart. Okay, done. We should be able to walk down the streets and say, hey, everybody, I know this guy. He resurrected. He did all this stuff. And it should just be attractional. Like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I'll follow that guy. I mean, people follow other people for less stuff. So what I'm trying to get at is, is if Jesus really is real and he really walked out of the grave, as real as that is, so is everything else that's in the Bible that Jesus wrote and that Jesus taught. It, it's all the same level of real. But for some reason, we don't believe it all on the same level. It's easy for me to celebrate that Easter's the day that Jesus came out of the tomb. It's hard for me to believe that Jesus loves me or that God loves me on Monday morning when I can't pay a bill or my car breaks down or I have uh, family issues or when I walk out of here and you go, some of you guys won't make it through Easter lunch before you hate each other and you argue and you fight. And so it's, so it's, it's hard, it's easy to say, yeah, today's the day, but then tomorrow life happens and it's hard to believe that part of it. And, and the reason for that is, is this, this word that we're gonna look at today, it's, it's doubt. We, we have doubts. 
It's easy to have doubts. We have doubts that Jonah was really swallowed by a whale. We have doubts that Jesus, you know, resurrected and raised himself. We have doubts that it was actually documented and that it was actually seen. We have doubts that God loves us. We have doubts that our car is going to start. Right now, I've got a relay in my car, and some of the people in here will know about it, and it's got a little fuse in it, and it doesn't always work. And every time I get my car to start it, I doubt that it's going to start. And so every time it starts, good day. Good day, great day. Battery's fine. Alternator's fine. Starter's fine. As Andy up here is enjoying that. Just this little, this little electrical part. I could get it fixed, but life's more fun when I don't know if my car's going to work. <laughs> so, I mean, we have doubts about everything. But, but then if we go forward a little bit more, we add a little bit more to it, and take our doubts, and then we add the word spiritual to it, now we have this concept of spiritual doubt. And this is something that we're not supposed to have. I mean, this is something that, that we even could feel ashamed as, as Christians, as Christ followers. Those of you that, are, that say, hey, I believe in Jesus, and I, He is my Lord and Savior, you're not supposed to have spiritual doubt. It's because I, I believe in Jesus. I made Him the Lord of my life. I believe that Jesus resurrected. I believe He walked out of the grave. But then things happen in your life, and, and, and you're supposed to not worry or be anxious, but you, you worry and you're anxious. You're supposed to believe that Jesus is for you, even in the hard times, but it's a hard time, and you don't feel like anybody is for you. And then when people ask you, hey, how's it going? Oh, you know, praise God, God's good, you know. You say that on the outside, but on the inside, you're saying, I, if, if, the, if God, if, if God, if there is God. See, our spiritual doubt is something that, that run, it runs deep in some of us. Some of us, it doesn't. There, there's, some, there's some stalwarts, some rock-hard people that they just have learned over time to not doubt but, but they're almost like the minority because there's a, there's a majority of us that struggle with this. And actually, this idea of spiritual doubt is what keeps a lot of people from coming to Jesus because you feel like, if I accept Jesus, then am I allowed to doubt? Or what happens if I doubt? Does that mean that me accepting him counts or doesn't count? And see, today we're going to see that there's a relationship between the resurrection and your doubt. Those two are very much tied together. And it's not that because there's a resurrection, you should have no doubt. It's what it is, is because there's a resurrection and because Jesus rose from the grave, then that means that there is a meaning to your doubt and that your doubts can be used in a different way. Because of the resurrection, your doubt can actually do something different than, than you think. And we're going to learn that. But there's a direct re relationship between those two terms. So if you're a doubter, if you struggle with spiritual doubt, if you doubt anything about the Bible, anything about God's Word, anything, then this is, this is the perfect message for you. Because we're going to tie the resurrection to today, when Jesus walked out of the grave, to those, those doubts. But before we do that, I want to pick up from where we were last, I say last week. It feels like it's been a week since Friday, but... On Friday, we left off where Jesus was, was uh, hanging on the cross and he, you know, had, had taken his last breath and he let go of everything. And so here we are. It's before sundown. And so on, on, on Good Friday, Friday before sundown, they had to take Jesus off the cross because Saturday was the Sabbath. And the, the, the Jewish tradition was you couldn't have somebody, you know, you couldn't do work on the Sabbath. You definitely couldn't leave anybody up on the cross on the Sabbath because we don't, we don't want to violate the holy laws, even though God is literally hanging on the cross. But they don't know that. And so what happens is, is normally someone would be pulled off the cross. And especially if they wanted to speed up the process of them dying, they would go through and they would break the legs of the people hanging there, which would cause them to lean on their, on their chest. Their shoulders would dislocate. They wouldn't be able to breathe. And they would, they would basically asphyxiate. And, and they went through and they did that. And, and Jesus, he had already, you know, he'd already died. He had let out his last breath. And even there was a centurion soldier, a battle-hardened soldier, that when he watched Jesus release his last breath, he said, I've never seen anything like the control that I saw in that man. He must truly be the Son of God. And so they pierced his side to make sure he was dead. And, and so Jesus is, is dead. They break the legs of the other guys. They're dead. Normally what would happen is they would throw them into a garbage heap or into a dump. And then the animals would eat or, or they would set them on fire, burn them. But they, they took them out to the city dump. They dumped them there. If you were wealthy enough, 
and had the right connections. You could bribe somebody and you could get the body. And so there's a, a guy named Joseph. And Joseph comes in and, and he's, he's a Pharisee. He's part of the council that put Jesus on the cross. But he did not agree with Jesus being put to death. He wasn't on for that. He said, no, 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 this is wrong. This guy's an innocent man. And so he comes in and he, he goes to Pilate and because he's got you know, influence and wealth, Pilate receives him and they have a, a talk and Pilate says, I'll, I'll give you the body. So then he gets the body, he wraps him in linen and he takes him to, what, what's funny is, is in the, the, one of the, the scripture texts says a borrowed tomb. You know, it's like he didn't know Jesus would rise, but Jesus knew he'd rise. So he's like, Jesus is like, let me just borrow this for three days. So he puts Jesus in, in this tomb and it's a tomb that no one had ever been in. And they roll a big rock in front of it. And it seals Jesus in there. And so there Jesus is. Buried, dead, gone, done. So where are the disciples at this time? The disciples, they're, they fl they're gone. They completely fled. Peter stuck around a little bit while Jesus was on trial. But when, when Jesus was on trial, a little girl asked Peter, said, hey, aren't you part of, you know, that guy's group? And Peter, like, ran away. He's gone. All the disciples fled. They're gone. And actually, where, where they are is they're, they're hiding in a house. They're in the upper room, probably the same upper room that they had the Lord's Supper in. And they're sitting in there, and they actually have the door barred. And we'll read that in a little bit in the Scripture, that, because they're afraid of the, of the Jews, because now they've crucified Jesus, and this is Jesus' 12, you know, inner circle here, so, or 11 at this point, because Judas has, you know, had an unfortunate event. And so Jesus, they're, they're worried that, man, the next thing that happens is they're going to come after us, so they bar the doors. See, what you need to know is that literally no one knew that Jesus was going to rise from the grave. Not a single person, no human on earth knew that it was going to happen. All those years of Jesus teaching, telling, all those times that Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to die, the temple's going to be destroyed, it's going to be rebuilt in three days. And then Jesus even goes on to say, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to be leaving you. Jesus explains it to the disciples over and over and over again. He teaches all this stuff. And when Jesus dies, the religion is, is gone. The relationship is gone. This movement of Christ is gone. See, they thought Jesus would be a king. He would be the Messiah, he would be the coming king. But they kind of thought that meant that he would be the one that would set the Jews free from, from Roman control. And he wasn't that. That's actually why Judas betrayed Jesus. Because he thought, let me just kickstart Jesus' process and get him arrested so that he then like flexes his muscles and we defeat the Romans. Judas didn't know he would be crucified. So the disciples are gone it's important for you to know that there is not one single soul on earth that knew or that believed that Jesus was going to walk out of that tomb. Not a single person. See, that, see, if you struggle with doubt, if you struggle with spiritual doubt, it's okay. You haven't spent three years walking side by side with the Messiah. These guys did for three years. They walked with Jesus. They did ministry with Jesus. They watched him do miracles. They dined with him. They had a relationship with him. Jesus tells them exactly what's going to happen. He dies. They throw it all out the window. They react in fear and they bar themselves in a room for safety. No one believed. So doubt. That's doubt. That's spiritual doubt. To the extreme. So no one believes that Jesus is going to rise. But Jesus... He does make an appearance. See, it's because Jesus made this appearance that, that we know that he came out of the tomb. See, if no one saw him come out of the tomb, it's like you always catch the biggest fish when no one's around. You know? Someone comes with you, oh, you know, the fish aren't biting today. But when you're alone, that's when you, you know, get the big trout, you know? And so Jesus, when he... When he comes out of the tomb, he, he makes these appearances. He shows himself to people. And in fact, on Easter Sunday, the Sunday that Jesus rises out of the tomb, the, sun, the sun's out, the birds are chirping, everything's wonder, every, wonderful, everything's just beautiful. His first appearance is, is to a lady named Mary, Mary Magdalene. And she was coming to the tomb because she was going to prepare Jesus' body better. 
And so on Friday, when Jesus died and was put in the tomb, she gathered everything to do that. But on Saturday, she wouldn't go to the tomb because that's the Sabbath. So she respected and followed the Sabbath law. So then on Sunday, she said, okay, now it's time to go. And she goes. And when she goes, that she has an encounter with Jesus. Jesus appears to her. And then right after that, there, there's another encounter that Jesus has with another lady named Mary. But this is the mother of James. And then two other women. And, and they were on their way. See, they had, had encountered Jesus at the tomb. And, and then they were, or she, they'd heard Mary had encountered Jesus at the tomb. And they're on their way to tell the disciples about Jesus. And actually, they see Jesus while they're on their way to tell the disciples that Jesus is risen. And when they see him, this is so important, they actually bow down and they touch his feet. And, and, and what this does is it, it's important because it means that Jesus wasn't a vision he, he wasn't, like, they weren't dehydrated and seeing stuff. He was real. They touched his feet, and they also worshiped him. And Jesus allowed them to worship him. Why? Because he was the risen son of God. He received the worship that he, he was owed as the Messiah. And then after that, there's another encounter. And this time, Jesus encounters Peter. And I like to think that this is more of a, it's a private encounter, because this is the first disciple that, that Jesus sees. And Peter denied Jesus three times. We, we don't know what happened in this encounter. We just know that it happened. But I would love to know what Jesus said to Peter in that time. And then after Peter, there's another encounter. And in fact, it's two disciples. And, and they're actually on their way out of town. They're on this road out of town. And the reason that they're leaving is the, these were Jesus' disciples. They came to follow Jesus. Jesus died. So they're done. They're leaving. Like, well, I guess that's done. Let's go home. And they're walking away from Jerusalem because Jesus is dead. They don't know he's risen. And Jesus encounters them. He has an encounter there. And then now on Sunday night, the fifth encounter. Jesus has five encounters just on Sunday night. In the same day. So the disciples, he encounters them. But this time, Thomas is not with them. So this is just a group. Thomas had to step out. He had to go to the bathroom. He's gone. Jesus comes in. Let's look at the scripture. Let's look at John 20 so we can see this here. This is, this is, this is so important. So when it was evening on the same day, the first day of the week, so that's Sunday for them, though the disciples were meeting behind barred doors because they're terrified for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace to you. That would have been a bit of a jump scare for me. You know, you're behind barred doors. Jesus just like appears and he's, what's up guys? It's, you know, and that's essentially what, what it is. And so he says, hey guys, peace, peace to you. And then after he said this, he shows them his hands and he shows them his side. And when the disciples saw, they saw it with their eyes. They were filled with great joy. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you as my representatives. So Jesus is saying, okay, I'm here, I'm back. And the disciples, they see him. And they see the, 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 the scars, and they see the marks, and they, okay. And Jesus says, you're going to be my disciples, you're going to represent me. And, and then in the next verse, it talks about them receiving, you know, the Holy Spirit. And, and Jesus is basically like, I'm giving you this helper that I told you that I would give you. And, and, and that, that, that's the fifth encounter. And, and then eight days later, there's another encounter. See, Jesus reveals himself over and over and over and over again. Eight days later, Jesus encounters the disciples again. This time, Thomas is not in the bathroom. So now they're all there. And then after that happens, Jesus has seven disciples that he encounters, and they're fishing at the Sea of Galilee. And Peter's part of this. Jesus actually comes up and makes some breakfast that morning. And then after that, you've got the Great Commission, which, is, which was for the 11 disciples, and then they think even more of Jesus' kind of following crowd. And this is where, where Jesus says, I want you to go and make disciples. He gives them this Great Commission. This is what you're going to do with your life. And then, if that wasn't enough, Jesus appears to over 500 people at one time. And, and Paul here is, is writing about that. And then, if that's not enough, another time Jesus appears to uh, his half-brother James. See, <clears throat> right there, I lost count. It's like 10. 9 or 10 times that Jesus has appeared. 
We, we, we can't deny that that happened. But that doesn't take away our doubt. You know, there's, there's one more really uh, important appearance. This is after Jesus has ascended to heaven. Jesus comes down post his ascension and he appears to Paul. That's, that's in Acts 9, 3 through 5. I wanted to just put the, the, the scripture on screen for you so you could look it up and so you knew that I didn't make it up. But, but he, Jesus appears to Paul after the ascension. I mean, to, yeah, to, to me, how do we deny that? You know, and, and that's just here. There's records of it even outside of the Bible. I mean, th- th- this isn't something that just we think. This is one of the most proven, uh, recorded events. Jesus walked out of that tomb, and he showed himself to a bunch of people. Now, I, I want to talk about the king of doubting. And we all know his name, Doubting Thomas, right? Thomas was... Was a doubter. I don't know if anyone watched Winnie the Pooh growing up. Do we have any, any Winnie the Pooh people in here? Okay, we got, yeah, we got a couple. Th- Thomas is, is, has been named the Eeyore. You know, he's like, you know, down, you know, I don't believe it. I believe it when I see it, you know. Thomas is, is, is called Doubting Thomas. And I don't think that that's really fair. Thomas gets a bad shake here. He really gets dealt a bad card because, see, Thomas was gone when Jesus came and he appeared to the, to the disciples. Now, they didn't have any more faith than Thomas did. Thomas just had not seen Jesus yet. The other disciples had the exact same doubt, the exact same lack of faith. The only difference between the other disciples and Thomas is that they were in the room and Thomas was not in the room. So it's kind of unfair to call him doubting Thomas because they, they all doubted. But, but Thomas has this really special encounter with Jesus. See, what Thomas wants is Thomas wants his own faith. He doesn't want to claim the faith based on the other 11 disciples. Because I'm sure Thomas would be like, well, okay, if you're saying Jesus is alive, why are we still sitting here behind barred doors? You know, what's what's going on with that? Why, why, you know, Thomas is trying to put the pieces together and he just flat out lays down an ultimatum. He just says, "Uh uh-uh, hang on. If I'm going to believe this, I I want it. I want to see it. So this is what Thomas says to the disciples. And the disciples are all sitting around like, Come on, you, you should believe us. You know, I can't believe you don't believe us. We saw it. It was amazing. You know, it was incredible. And Thomas is probably like, yeah, but how, you know, but, but you, it's because you saw, you know. And so Thomas, he says, one of the tw- he's one of the 12. He was also called Didymus, the twin. But he was not with them when, the, when Jesus came. So the other disciples, they kept telling him, we've seen the Lord. They said, hey, we've seen him. We've seen him. We've seen him. He's like, yeah, right. It's no different from the disciples before they saw Jesus being told by, by Mary and others, hey, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen, and they're like, mm, we're still going to bar this door. We're still going to lock the door. But you know, what's, what's amazing is that, is that a, a rock didn't keep Jesus in a tomb and a door didn't keep Jesus out of the room, right? Because Jesus just passed through the wall. See, when Jesus was, was resurrected, he, he no longer was bound to the rules of our body, of human body because Jesus had broken, you know, the chains of sense. Jesus is no longer bound to us. Jesus could just pass through whatever, and he does that. But anyway, Thomas says, unless I see in his hands, he's got to see it, the marks of the nails, and I put my fingers into the nail prints, and I put my hand into his side where I've been pierced with a spear, I will never, ever believe. So is it okay for Thomas to doubt. Because what you could argue is that Thomas has got the most evidence because now he has the disciples that have seen Jesus and he's got these ladies that have seen Jesus. So the question that we ask is, is it okay for Thomas to doubt? Is that okay? See, Thomas, it, the, the answer to that is, is yes. It's okay for Thomas to doubt. It, it's fine. And, and here's why. This is, this is where it applies to you. Why is it okay for Thomas to doubt? And why is it okay for you to doubt? Well, the, the, the reason is this. Is, is, okay, what, what kind of faith can you really have if you've never had to work through any doubts? What kind of faith can you really have if you've never had to work through any doubts? How do you know how sharp a knife is unless you take it out and cut something. You don't. 
How do you know how fast a car can go unless you get in it and push the gas pedal and see where it takes you? You don't. Faith is the same way. Until you work through your doubts, until you test your faith, until you try your faith, until you come on the other side of that, you don't know how much faith you have or you don't have because you've not tested it. Karina, go back a slide for us. See, Thomas was working through some doubts. And the disciples were working through some doubts. And you need to work through some, some doubts. Do, do, do you know how uh, steel is, is, is made? How, how, it's, how it's hardened? Well, what they do is they, they, they take a piece of steel, you know, raw steel, and they heat it. And they, they heat it over 1,000 degrees Celsius. And they just get it red, red, red hot. And, and they take it and then they, they beat on it and they shape it and they shape it and they shape it. And it's kind of like our doubts shape us, shape us, shape us. You know, you get hot and sweaty when your doubts kick in and the bills come and you can't pay them. Your doubts just heat you up and then life is beating you and beating you and Jesus is shaping you and shaping you, but you don't really know it, but that's what's happening. And it gets super, super hot and you get the metal where you want it and shape the way that you want it. And then to, to, to make it stick, to make it hard, you take that and you just, you quench it, you drop it into oil and it just immediately, it drops the temperature. And that oil drops it down and then after that happens, you pull it out and then you bake it in an oven, you temper it. And, and that's a process of just steel getting hardened. And, and our, our doubts are the same way. See, if we don't, the doubt that you have today is a doubt that you get to work through. And when you get on the other side of your doubt today, your faith is made stronger. And so, so this is what you need to understand here. And I want you to see this. Your doubts are not the result of, of your faithlessness. They instead are the strengthening agent of real faith. So if you doubt, if Thomas, Thomas was doubting, it's okay. Thomas said, I need to see it. And then he got on the other side of that. We, we say, okay, I, I doubt. I don't have all that faith. I don't have a lot of faith here. I've got a ton of doubts. Well, your doubts are strengthening agents for your faith. So if you're the most, if you're the person in here with the most doubt, then you're also the person in here with the most potential to have the greatest faith. But what I want you to do is I want you something practical. I just want you to start small. So... This is, this is where I step in really, really practically. And I say, okay, it's great that the Bible said it. It's great that Jesus said it. It's great that we're teaching it you know, up here on stage. But, but what does it really mean to you? You may be sitting there thinking, but what does that really mean to me? How do I just, okay, I'm going to give all my doubts to God. Done. I'm stronger. I don't feel stronger. Everything feels the same, looks the same. Just, I want you to start small. And I say this because it, it, I know this is where I was. I want you to just start with the smallest little doubt that's in your mind, the smallest, teeniest, tiny little doubt. Take that tiny little small one and just surrender that to God. And the way that you do that, this is real easy, is you just say, God, I have a doubt and this is what it is. Can you help me get on the other side of it? Don't know what the other side looks like. Don't know if I believe in you yet. Don't, know, don't have any expectations of what's gonna happen, but I'm just gonna take this tiny little doubt and I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to say, God, here's my doubt. Help me get on the other side of it. It's that, it's that easy. And, and we see this in, in, in Thomas. Because eight days later, the disciples were again inside the house. And Thomas was, was with them. And Jesus came through the doors. Doors are still barred, okay? Everyone's seen Jesus except Thomas. And they're still scared. They're still hiding behind closed doors. So Jesus comes through the doors that had been barred and he stood among them. And again, he says, what's up guys? And then in verse 27, he, he goes on here and he says, then he says to Thomas, goes right to Thomas who had the doubt. He says, reach here with your finger and see my hands and put your hand in the place of my side. Do not be unbelieving, but stop doubting and instead believe. See, so Jesus was helping Thomas work through his doubt. And then in the next verse, Thomas responds to Jesus and he responds really, really well. And he says, my Lord and my God. So he says, You're, you are Jesus. I believe it. I believe it. I saw it and I believe it. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, do you now believe? You've seen me. Now do you believe? See, I, I believe that if you start small and you give God 
that tiny, the tiniest little doubt that you have, don't give him your biggest doubt. Don't lay in bed and doubt the existence of the universe and say, God, help me get on the other side of that. Start with the tiny one. God, I doubt my car will start. Let me just give that to you. And then watch what God does with that. And see, he says, because you've seen me, do you now believe? When you give God a little doubt, you also give yourself an opportunity to see God. You get an opportunity to see Jesus work in your life. And so, he's blessed. Thomas is blessed, which means happy, spiritually secure, favored by God. And then Jesus says, and they who did not see me and yet believed in me, that they will have an even greater reward. See, that, that's, that's us. Because we, we, we're not in that barred room. So Jesus is like, you believe me because you saw me. But I've got even more for those that believe in me without seeing me. And, th- and that's, that's us. And so Thomas, he goes from, becoming, from, from doubting Thomas. And then he becomes faithful to the end, Thomas. And, and, and this is where when you give Jesus your doubts, starting from your smallest... He takes care of that, and then he takes another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. And then you end up in this place where Thomas is, faithful to the end. Thomas, do you know why Thomas is faithful to the end? Because Thomas took the gospel further than almost any other disciple, and he went all the way up into India with it. And all the way up into India, Thomas is, is, is martyred, and, and he's, he's told to renounce his faith. And Thomas doesn't do it. At the threat of death, Thomas says, I will not renounce Jesus again. Jesus died and he resurrected for me and I have no doubt in that. And Thomas was martyred for that. Another disciple martyred was Peter. Peter, he denied Jesus three times. And then Peter would end up being crucified in Rome. And, and Peter said, I, I will not renounce my, my relationship with Jesus. I will not renounce this movement because I doubted Jesus three times. Jesus restored me three times. And I will never, ever, ever doubt Jesus again. And so, no, I stand my ground. I stand my ground on what Jesus said and who he said that he was. And he was crucified and that he wanted to be crucified upside down because he wasn't even worthy of being crucified in the way that Jesus was. Then, hey, we could also look at Paul. Paul here, who was the feared tormentor of the Christians. He didn't believe in Jesus so much that he was out killing people who said that they did. Has an encounter with Jesus, changes his life. Paul would go on to change the world by taking Jesus to the Gentiles, which is anyone that's not Jewish. And then because of that, Paul would end up being beheaded in Rome. Paul would not. While Paul is waiting to be beheaded, he's sending encouragement to churches. You know, let's, let's go on here, just in case you're not convinced yet. You have John. John was exiled. He's the one that wrote Revelations. <clears throat> You've got Andrew, martyred in Russia. Philip, martyred in North Africa. Bartholomew, martyred in Ethiopia. Matthew, stabbed to death in Africa. James, clubbed to death in northern Israel. And it goes on. Then you've got Simon here. He was sawed in half in Persia. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not going to lie. I, I, you know, hey, I'm not renouncing my faith. And the moment you're put in that, you know, and you feel that first tug of the saw, I'd be like, Jesus is pretty forgiving, you know. <laughs> yeah. I believe he died for my sins. I'm going to sin one more time. <laughs> I'm just going to look, you know. But, he, but he, he didn't. Simon said, I will not. I will not take away my faith. Thaddeus, death by arrows in Turkey. Matthias, martyred at the Caspian Sea. Philip, martyred in Turkey. Matthew, stabbed to death. James, it was clubbed to death here. See, see, Jesus, Jesus did something in their lives. Jesus resurrected and he walked out of the tomb. And all these men that I just told you ended up giving their lives to Jesus. They started out doubting. They gave their doubts to God. And when they gave their doubts to God, God made them stronger. He made their faith stronger. If you're doubting, you're positioned perfectly for stronger faith. There's no better day to to mark and celebrate the fact that Jesus' resurrection changes everything for us. 
Because Jesus' resurrection even changes your doubts. You can't even doubt wrong. Because Jesus will take that and he'll make you better for it. See, all these men were not liars. It, 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 couldn't, it couldn't be false that they would give their life for somebody that they didn't see come out of the tomb. They watched Jesus come out of the tomb. They watched Jesus heal their doubts. That's the power of the resurrection. That, that's why everything that we claim as Christians, as Christ followers, that's why it matters. That's why it's real. It's because Jesus resurrected. He appeared to hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people afterwards. And then he went on to take care of their doubts so that all these people will go across the world and profess the gospel of Jesus and even give their lives to it. People don't give their lives to stuff unless they really, really, really believe in it. And we have here a record of people believing in it. And so what I want to leave you with today is, is I want to leave you with, with a, a quote, with something for you to say. And this is something that, that you can say when you give your, your smallest doubt to God. When you take that tiny little doubt, see, I, I wish that you understood and that you knew the potential that you carry, even with those smallest doubts. Because you have so much potential. You know, we, we talk about giving people an easy win. You know, it's like, okay, you know, you've got, you've got those with parents that have kids. You want your kids to, to feel like they can grow and that they can learn. And sometimes you want to give them an easy win. It builds momentum. So you give, you give them something or you set them up in a way that they can win in something. Even if it's things that they're struggling with. You know, you, you, you give them an easy win. And, and that's what God wants to do for us. Take that tiny little doubt and give you an easy win. And then that becomes more and more and more and more. And then we can say this every day. And I, I've got it up here. You can take a picture of it. Or you can watch back on, on the, 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 the message on YouTube. But this is what we say. In my doubts, I press into God. So that means that I go to God. If you're super religious, you could get on your knees. You could lay down. You could open the Bible, smack your forehead on the right verse and say, I'm pressing into you, Lord. Just press the Bible into you. That's, that's actually fine. Do that. But I press into God. It could also just be you saying, you know, like an awkward first date in middle school or in, in you know, grade five or six, you know, standing next to, you know, this person that you, you don't know what to say or how to say it and just saying, okay, well, God, uh, you know, I've got this doubt and I kind of want to want to give it to you. Just want to lean into into you. You know, is it a lean, a side hug? But I press into God and he reveals himself to me in a way that moves me through my doubts to a faith that believes the tomb is empty. So we take our doubts to God and then he reveals himself to you in a way that helps you move through those doubts and take you to a place of belief that the tomb is empty. See, my, my hope and prayer for you today as we wrap up here this morning is, is that when you walk out of here, we, we all know the, the Easter story. We all know Jesus rose. We all know that the tomb was empty. And that's something that we, we boom, we end on with a bang and it's amazing. But I thought, what if... If, if, if I just give you that and you walk out of here, the, the doubts are still going to come. The struggles are still going to come. So let me, let me give you something to take away. And so when you walk out of here today, I hope that there's a moment in your week where this statement gets triggered in your mind, where you have a doubt and you just say, you know what? It may be silly, but now's a perfect time. It's as good as any. I'm going to give this, I'm just going to give this to God and see what happens. And then... God will reveal himself to you in a way that moves you through that doubt to a faith that believes that the tomb is empty. So I'm going to pray for us. And, and before I do that, I just want to give you guys a moment to reflect on this. 
And we've got some prayer partners that will come down on the sides. If, if God has spoken to you or, or you're confused or, or even you just need to pray or tell somebody something, anything. Pray for anything or tell. Just bring somebody into your world. That's what they're down here for. Uh, we're not your solution, but we will stand in your problem with you or stand in your praise with you. And then I just want you, as you sing this last song, for you to, to ask yourself, God, and you don't have to believe in God to ask this. God... If you're there, show me a tiny doubt. What's the tiny little doubt that I have that I can give you? And then just help me doubt or help me trust and not doubt that you'll get me through that and get me to the other side. You can be honest with God. Honest, raw, real. We all carry doubts. Don't act like you don't have them. We've got massive doubts. And I just pray that God reveals that to you here. Let's bow our heads. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you that not only did you give your life for us, but you resurrected, you rose from the tomb. And as you did that, you took away anything bad that can come from us, e even doubting. So Lord, I pray just directly that every heart in this room, that it would hear from you, that it would be impacted by you, that it would be touched by you. I pray, Father, that you would bring to people's minds uh, these doubts that they carry, even the small ones. Lord, let everyone have brought to their mind something that they doubt, something that they carry, something that they can give to you. And so, Father, I pray for easy wins all over the room this morning and all over the rest of today. Heavenly Father, you are a good Father and you love us so much. I thank you for raising and walking out of that tomb. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.